The Lord be with you. And also with you. Friends, welcome to worship on this uh, uh, snowy Sunday morning. Uh, so uh, we, we ended up canceling or postponing the uh, supper for two weeks, uh, our luncheon, because we weren't really sure what the weather was going to do. Lo and behold, we probably just should have had faith. Um, but as it is, we'll meet, uh, we'll have our luncheon in two weeks and, uh, and hopefully have some really good discussion. Uh, again, if, if uh, you haven't had a chance to read through those documents or you know what we've talked about, what I've been putting out there, I also have a little book if you're interested in reading a little bit more about, uh, it's called Rediscovering Church. The session has read it as well as the revitalization team. If you, you're interested in reading it, I strongly encourage you to. It's got some great information. Uh, but uh, reach out to those folks who you also know who you haven't seen come to church very often or very uh, frequently. Uh, I want them to be here for those conversations as well. They're going to bring some insights uh, that uh, perhaps maybe we won't have fully have. So it would be great to have everyone there, uh, especially at least for that first part of those conversations where Pastor Tom will lead us. Uh, the Super Bowl of Caring is still going on, so we're going to be collecting uh, both a, a financial offering as well as canned goods in support of Dawn. Uh, if you brought canned goods, there's a little table out in the hallway. You can put them out there. Uh, and we'll continue collecting through, I think, about Tuesday. Uh, I'll, I'll take the canned goods over Wednesday morning to Dawn. Uh, so if you, if you forgot or missed or, or just didn't get a chance to bring anything, uh, you can bring it by Monday or Tuesday, and we'll, we'll be sure to get it over there to Dawn. Um, those are the rest of my announcements. Are there any others to lift up? I know we got a very special announcement from Al, so go ahead, Al. We praise God because I know he's on your side and he's, he's working with you, through you, through those doctors. We praise God for that wisdom, the intellect that he's gifted them. It's, we give all praise to him. So it's always good to, to serve the Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Al. Any other announcements? All right. Well, hearing none, then let us prepare our hearts to worship the Lord.
believe the Spirit is with us this morning. I like to say, not only are you a miracle, but you are a blessing. Here now, I call to worship from Psalm 32, 1 through 6. <clears throat> Blessed is he whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they shall not come near him. Come, let us, let us worship God with him. 379 in the Presbyterian hymnal, my hope is built on nothing less. To the Lord our God belong compassion and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. Nor have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his teachings, which he set before us through his servants, the prophets. That's from Daniel 9, 9 through 10. In light of this teaching, let us offer our prayer of confession. Holy God, we know that a little faith can produce great work in your kingdom. Yet we are too timid to bear the fruit of your righteousness. For we walk by sight and not by faith. Forgive us, Lord, for our disobedience. Renew us with the love of Christ so that we live no longer for ourselves, but for him who gave us his righteous robes. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ unmasked the idols of our world and frees us from our slavery to sin. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
church, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join me in prayer. By your spirit, O God, enlighten our hearts, open our minds, fill our vision with your radiance, and give us life as we hear your word today. Amen. New Testament lesson today is from John 1, 43 through 51. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, Now do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God.
Amen. Thank you, choir. Thank you all. You may be seated. And now we enter the portion of our service. We lift up prayers for our families, for our friends, for the church, for the world. You see the prayer request printed in your bulletins. Are there any others you wish to lift up at this time? Yes, Gary. So we'll certainly lift up the family of Kathy Roach. Thank you, Gary. Any others? Yes, Stephanie. Um, prayers for Holden Wells, whose mother passed away on Thursday, and also his brother, who passed away. Oh, goodness. So we'll certainly pray for William Wells and his family. <coughs> yes, John. So we'll pray for B. Arthur that that surgery goes well. Thank you, John. Any others? Well, I have a praise. Sure. Um, Gary's mother actually tested positive for COVID two weeks ago, but she had a mild case and is out of the isolation now. And we are getting a few less calls about cases up at Autumn Care, but it's, it's still up there. Sure. But Well, that's certainly a praise. We praise God that he saw her through that, and we certainly praise God that those uh, cases are going down, so thank you. Any others? All right. Well, seeing none, then let us bring these prayers to the Lord. We praise and thank you, O Lord, that you feed us with your word. Grateful for your gifts and mindful of the communion of your saints, we offer to you our prayers for all people. O God of compassion, we remember before you the poor and the afflicted, the sick and the dying, prisoners and all who are lonely, the victims of war, injustice, and inhumanity, and all others who suffer from whatever their sufferings may be called. <coughs> o Lord of Providence, holding the destiny of the nations in your hand, we pray for our country. Inspire the hearts and minds of our leaders that they, together with all our nation, may first seek your kingdom and righteousness so that order, liberty, and peace may dwell with your people. O oh God, the Creator, we pray for all nations and all peoples Take away the mistrust and lack of understanding that divide your creatures. Increase in us the recognition that we are all your image bearers. O oh, Savior God, Look upon your church in her struggle upon the earth. Have mercy on her weakness. Bring to an end her unhappy divisions and scatter her fears. Look also upon the ministry of your church. Increase her courage, strengthen her faith, and inspire her witness to all people, even to the ends of the earth. Author of grace and God of love, send your Holy Spirit's blessing to your children here present. Keep our hearts and thoughts in Jesus Christ, your Son, our only Savior, who has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, our, our next hymn is a, a new oldie hymn. Raise your hand if you're familiar with this hymn, My Savior's Love. Does that sound familiar to some of you? I know we've got a couple Baptists in here. Maybe that was familiar too. This is a new hymn to me as a Pentecostal growing up. So it's Hymns of Grace in the black, uh, the black hymnal number 105. Uh, if I sent out a video, you may have watched it. You may not have. If you did watch it, I think we're going to speed it up a little bit. Is that right? So if you will, please stand and join with me in singing Hymns of Grace number 105, My Savior's Love. You all may be seated. After singing it, does it sound familiar to anyone else who didn't raise? Yeah, okay. You yeah, have a couple more. It's, uh, it's, it's a great one. Reminds us of the truth of the gospel of who Christ is and what he has done for us. Church, let us open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, 
First of all, it is indeed a, a true privilege for us to be here on this day and in this place to worship your holy name, to praise the glories of your work, to uh, honor your word. Lord, I pray that you focus our attention to your word, to the truth of your word. Lord, I pray that you guide our hearts to a deeper understanding of who you are and who we are in light of your truth. So, Lord, we pray all this in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen. Well, we are now in chapter 2 of our series in the book of Genesis. My goal from here on out is to uh, take each chapter and we'll just read through it, uh, kind of like a, a Bible study. We'll read through it and we'll exposit some verses uh, here and there, uh, in groups of passages, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to see the narrative of creation, the narrative of God's grace present. I do want to remind you that the whole story of Genesis, indeed the whole story of the Bible, is about God's sovereign grace at work in the world. And we'll see when we get to chapter 3 why that's so important. But for now, chapter 2, we are still in, uh, in paradise. Uh, let me read these first three verses of this chapter. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their host. And by the seventh day God com completed his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. So here we see in these first three verses the climax of creation. This is the end of the creation week. Uh, chapter 1, if you remember, was six days of, of God creating, God creating this world, God creating man in his own image and placing him in this garden. And uh, God has done all of this, and now he rests. This is the climax of what has been going on in these first parts of Genesis. Everything has been pointing to this. Notice it's not everything has been pointing to the creation of man. While that is very good, because God says it's very good, that isn't the climax. The climax is holy rest. And hopefully we'll see in this next chapter, in this chapter, in chapter 3, how that holy rest is manifested. Holy rest is very important. Uh, and, and indeed, it's so important that the fourth commandment is given to Moses in Exodus chapter 20. If you remember when he's giving that command, when God is giving it to Moses, the fourth commandment says you shall keep the Sabbath day holy, and he explains why. God explains why, because in six days he created, and on the seventh day he rested. So God bases Sabbath rest in creation. So what does that mean? One that means Sabbath has existed long before Moses ever wrote that in stone because that's important to remember sabbath didn't come the sabbath commandment wasn't created on on mount sinai the sabbath commandment was created in the garden and that's important for us because we have to then understand what is sabbath rest what what do we do when we are resting well let's look at god's example a little later in uh, in uh, chapter three we'll see that God would, would walk in the garden with Adam and Eve, that he would look for him, that they would have communion together. Well, that must have started on the seventh day. Indeed, we don't know the timeline of these first three chapters, and we'll, I'll probably touch on that next week. But we know that God rested on the seventh day with his creation, with Adam and Eve with the, the king and queen of his garden, with the husband and wife whom he has put in this temple house. And so Sabbath rest is ceasing from our labors to enjoy the fruit thereof. That's what God does here. For six days he creates, and on the seventh day, verse 2, he completed his work and he rested from all his work which he had done. Now, what does that mean God did? Well, simply, he had recreation. 
he got to enjoy the fruits of his labor. He came down and, and like I said, walked with Adam and Eve. I imagine perhaps uh, God may have uh, strung up a, a hammock and just hung out with them and told them of the stories and uh, shared, you know, Adam maybe have been talking to him about all these animals that he was supposed to name. But notice what it is not. Sabbath rest isn't laziness. It's not doing nothing, moping about, being bored. That's not what Sabbath rest is. We, we see that, that God sanctified it. He made it holy. He set it apart. Why would God set the Sabbath day apart so that we can be lazy, do nothing? No. He set it apart so that we could have a day of communion rest with him. Now, does that mean for six days we, we have no communion with God? Absolutely not. God is everywhere present. God is always with us. Indeed, we know that God is helping us six days, seven days of the week. But he commands that one day out of seven, he commands that, he, that we set aside a time to commune with him. Now, I don't have time to go into all the intricacies of Sabbath and Lord's Day, but all I'll say is, is for us, for the Christian, that day is today. That day is Sunday morning, the day of resurrection, the Lord's Day, where we set aside time for God. Now, notice this time too often has become the hour or so that we're going to spend right now, the, the 90 minutes of Sunday morning. Do you think? Communion rest was just 90 minutes. Oh, I built 60, six days of creation. I'm just going to spend 90 minutes with Adam, and then what is God going to do? Go back to work? Go sleep? Be lazy? I don't know. God didn't do that. God established a whole day of Sabbath rest. That's important to remember on especially a day like today, the Super Bowl. Hopefully none of you all will, will get so excited, but maybe you will. I don't know. Remember, this is the Lord's day. If you bet money on whoever, I don't care. I'm not going to judge you. But just remember, this is the Lord's day. This whole day is the Lord's day. This whole day is a day that we honor and revere God in our actions. Does that mean we, we can't watch the Super Bowl? Absolutely not. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, be holy. Watch what you do, especially on God's day of Sabbath rest. Because this is a day that God has set aside, sanctified. You know that word in the, in the Hebrew here, that God sanctified uh, the, the seventh day. That root of the word, and, and my Bible study folks, you all know this, so I guess you can check out for the next two minutes. But it, it's this, like, think of a tailor, okay? Uh, you go to a tailor or a seamstress or someone, they're, they're going to make your clothing. So you're going to go get custom bespoke clothing, a nice suit or something, I don't know. The, the tailor has what's called a bolt, right? That's just the, the cloth. Right, Linda's not here, but I know she would agree with me, yeah. <laughs> that's that's the, the bolt of cloth. When the tailor pulls out the, the, what, you know, the yards that he's, he or she's going to use, what do they do? They take the scissors and they cut it out, and here's, here's what they're going to use for the, making the, the article of clothing. It's this action of cutting the bolt and separating this piece of fabric for special use. That is the Hebrew word sanctify or to make holy. It's to set apart. It's to take from common everyday use from the world, if you will, and set it here for God's special purposes. And that's what he has done. Six days of work, six days of creation, six days we go out there and we labor and toil and, and do the best we can. And on the seventh day, we set aside for him a day of rest, a day of focus, a day of recreation. And this is the end of the creation week. So now we get to verse four. Let me read this real quick. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God had made heaven and earth. Now, 
You probably noticed, especially if you've read chapter 2, things change a little bit from here forward. The, the narrative changes slightly. In reality, you know, whoever divided the, the chapters and verses, I don't know why they did it, but they put these first three verses of chapter 2 with chapter 2. When in reality, when in, within the narrative, I guess, this is the end of chapter 1, the six days, the seven days, uh, the holy week of creation. Um, so for whatever reason, chapter 2 begins with the very last day of the week. And remember, don't think Christian, remember, think Jewish week for a second. This is Saturday in the week, you know, if we were to use our, our Latin Roman language. Uh, God worked Sunday through Friday, and now Saturday, the Sabbath, God has set apart and rested. And so here in verse 4, we see a change, a, a shift. And, and what we're going to do, the, Moses is returning us to the sixth day of creation. We're, we're taking a pause and we're, we're zooming in to gain a deeper understanding of God's creation of man. I want to reiterate that it is an error to assume that there are two creation stories here. And there are beliefs, modern theologians, who say that, oh, well, this is one group writing this, and here's another group writing this. I will point out just an example that they point to. Verse 4, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven. That phrase, Lord God, that's in the Bible, in the Hebrew, uh, that's the word Yahweh or Jehovah. So if you have a King James Version Bible, your, your Bible might say Jehovah. In verse 3, the very previous verse, verse, we see that then God blessed the seventh day, sacrifice, he rested his work which God had created. That's the word Elohim. So there's two words used to describe God, and, and these theologians uh, say that, ah, well, see, look, there's two different stories going on here. These are two different myths that the Israelites have compiled together. Well, that's not the case. Moses is moving in to, he's talking about God the creator, Elohim, and now Moses is narrowing in on God the covenant maker, which is Yahweh, Jehovah, the Lord God. And we're going to see now what Moses is doing. Let me read verses 5 and 6. Now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, no plant of the field had yet sprouted, for the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. But a mist used to rise, used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. The modern theologians and scholars say, ah, look, see, you're wrong, Pastor Ed, because there it says there was no shrub of the field. How can that be when clearly on day three God created the plants? Well, notice there's no real contradiction here when you study the Hebrew. These are wild plants that were growing in chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. Let me just read those to you. Verse 11 and 12 of chapter 1. Then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit after their kind, with seed in them on the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind, and God saw that it was good. Notice that those are different plants. That's then what's mentioned here in verse 5. No shrub of the field. No plant of the field. And Moses even tells us the reason why at the end of this verse. And there was no man to cultivate the ground. There's not a contradiction here. What Moses is telling us is on the, I'm pretty sure I'll make sure I get the day right, on the third day, God created plants, vegetation, these whatever we see growing in the forest. Here, in verse 5, there was no agriculture. There was no one to cultivate, to tend this food, to, to harvest the food. This, of course, gives us a hint at the important role of Adam as the gardener of Eden. 
And so again, I see no contradiction or error in our holy writ. Verse 7, Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So here again, we see God zooming in on day six of creation. God has created man, the particular circumstances of his creation. Notice that this man is made from the created matter. He's made from the dust of the earth. He was brought forth out of this, just like the other creatures. Let me read, jump back to chapter 1, verse 20. Then God sled, let the waters teem with swarms of, of uh, or swarms with living creatures. Let birds fly above the earth in the open expanses of, of heaven. Verse 24, then God said, let the earth Earth, bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things and the beasts of the earth and their kind, and it was so. Here we see that God creates the, the animals, this world, the creatures on this planet out of this created terrestrial ball. Essentially what God is doing is out of nothing he creates this planet, and out of this created planet he creates life. He creates animal life. He creates human life. And so man is created from this dust, from the, the stuff that just blows in the wind. And that's important to remember. We are but dust. Yes, God loves us. Yes, God sent Christ to die for us. But we are still dust. The value, as I talked about last week of being the image of God, the value that human beings have is not innate to us. We are but dust. We have as much value as the, dirt, as the, the dust bunny under your bed. But that value that we do have is ascribed to us by God because we are made in his image. And here we see an aspect of how that image is imprinted on us. Verse 7 there again, God breathed into this man's nostrils the breath of life. This lifeless lump of clay who is to be given the image of God to live is done so by, given, by being given the ruach. That's the Hebrew word. That's the breath of God. Ruach in the Hebrew also happens to be the word spirit. And so in this breathing forth, this, this action of breathing life into the man, God isn't just breathing air into him, filling him up like a balloon. No, God is depositing in him a spirit. And now man has a spirit. He is given life by this spirit. This is important again to remember because this is why when Paul says, talking about the, the great uh, hope of the resurrection, that we will be joining with God. Well, how are we going to do that? You know, if, if, if the, the people are already in heaven, that's what Paul says, Thessalonians, we will join them. Their bodies are going to come up out of the ground when Jesus comes and returning. So if they're already there, how are they there? It's because they are spirit. They have a spirit. And so when, when a believer dies, our spirit ascends into heaven, joins with Christ, awaiting for the day that our body or the body will be resurrected with them. Verses 8 through 15. Let me read these. And the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Let me just pause there. I'm going to stop and just read that again. So remember, here, think about the geography of what's going on here. 
God has created man, blown life into him, and then God plants a garden toward the east. Notice that the garden is in Eden. I should have brought a little whiteboard because then I could draw it out for you. So you're going to have to use your imaginations. Eden is a location. We'll use a big circle. And it's in the east. God placed in Eden a garden. And in that garden, he establishes the man. So that's the geography of this. Now notice again here. Out of the ground, verse 9, the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to sight and good for food. So that tells me those things did not exist until that moment. As Moses said in verse 5, there was no shrub of the field, no plant of the field. The, the, the vegetation that was pleasing to the side and good for food had not yet come to flourish. Again, no contradiction here. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So in this garden, or in this Eden, in this garden, in the center, are two very special trees, and we're going to touch on those trees next week. We're going to come back to them a little bit later, I mean. Here we see, let me just keep going. Verse 10. Now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided and became four rivers. Let's think about the geography again, physics. God uses physics. How do rivers flow? Where do rivers come from? That's a better question. Where do they come from? Where, where, where are the, the, the fountainheads? In the mountains. Thank you, Chip. Most of the times, our rivers start in the mountains. And they flow down, gathering bigger. I mean, the tributaries and all those things. The Mississippi watershed and, and the Chesapeake watershed, I guess we're in that one. All rivers flow downhill. Water flows downhill. So what does that tell us then? That tells us a lot. That tells us Eden is probably in a mountain somewhere. And that's not surprising when you look at the Old Testament. Where does God interact with his people most intimately, especially before the tabernacle was built? God interacts with them on mountains. Noah is placed on Mount Ararat and has a covenant with God. Abraham ascends to Mount Moriah. Moses himself, writing this book, interacts with God on several mountains. So it should be no surprise then that Eden is on a mountain. And again, physics, water flows downhill. Notice what verse 10, the river flowed out of Eden, flows out of Eden to water the garden. So there's a river with a fountainhead somewhere. That river flows through the garden that the man is to cultivate, a garden with good food and two special trees. And from there, that river splits. It, it, it divides into four tributaries, four main rivers. Let me listen here what Moses is saying. The name of the first is Pishon. It flows around the whole land of Havilah, there, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. The bellium and the onyx stone are there. And the name of the second river is Gihon. It flows around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is Tigris. It flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. So again, think of the geography here. A mountain, Mount Eden, we'll just call it. We have Mount Eden with a, a very fountainhead of life. Isn't that what water represents? Villages pop up around rivers. Why? Because they are sources of life-giving water. So we have this Mount Eden, and we have this fountainhead of, of a river flowing through a garden, which we'll come back to this garden, and it flows out of this garden, and this river flows downhill, and it splits into four rivers. Two of these river names don't sound familiar to any of us, probably, but two of them should sound very familiar. The Tigris 
and the Euphrates. In fact, two of these rivers are very important today because smack dab in the middle of them is a very important and volatile city, the city of Baghdad, the city of Babylon. And so essentially what Moses is telling us is out of this Mount Eden, which has the flowing river of life, it goes down and this, mount, this uh, river feeds the world. The whole world subsists off of this life-giving source. Remember, we're still pre-fall. From Mount Eden, God blesses, flourishes the earth and the world. Eden, then, is a very holy place. In fact, you might even say Eden is a temple. A temple with a very special garden and a life-giving source. A temple that is tended by a man. Verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. Here, two words I want to talk a little bit about, verse 15. Adam is put into this garden, into this place just outside of a, a very holy place to tend the garden on Mount Eden that flow, from which flows life, the rivers of living water. Adam is to cultivate and to keep. Adam is to avad. That's the first Hebrew word. That word means to work, to serve, to till. That's where we get that notion of cultivating. Cain does the same thing. Adam's firstborn. Cain avads the ground. He tills the ground. You know who else avads in the Old Testament? Levitical priests. They work, they serve the temple, the tabernacle. The second word there, to keep shamer in the Hebrew. It means to watch, to preserve, or to guard. Abraham is told to do this as a patriarch. Each of the Davidic kings is told to do this. So do you see what's going on here? On Mount Eden, this holy place with a little garden that's to be tended by who? Adam, the priest king of God. Verses 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you shall surely die. So now we get to the two very special trees in the middle of this garden. Notice that Adam's dominion, remember we talked about that back in chapter 1, verse 26 and 27 that Adam is given dominion over this world. Adam's dominion is established with a covenant of works. Now let me explain very briefly what a covenant looks like in the Old Testament because that's very important. Those of you in Bible study, you all know this again. You can take a nap for a couple minutes, but then wake back up, please. Let me tell you a little bit about a covenant structure. First of all, a covenant in the Bible contains parties. There are people involved. Just think about a contract that you might have if you're hiring someone to do some work on your house. You are one party, the contractor is another. A contract is a form of covenant. There's two parties, and in the Old Testament, in the Middle Eastern world of this time, the two parties are the suzerain, that's a very fancy word to just mean the king, and the vassal. You probably know the word vassal, like a vassal state. So you have a superior and a subordinate. So what does that mean? Well, unlike your contract with your, uh, you know, the, the guy who's going to come fix your, your painting or whatever, you are not on equal footing in this. The suzerain, the king, is above and has authority over the vassal, the one who is lower, the one who is unequal to him. And so in the New Testament, or excuse me, in the Old Covenants, we have God, you bet, 
one guess where God is. And you could be wrong, but there's only one. He's the suzerain. He's the king. He's the one who establishes the covenant. Guess who the other person is? Mankind. You and me. The people on this earth. You guess, get one guess where you think they are. They're the vassals. Don't ever, ever, ever get that confused. And I'm being serious. Because as soon as we place ourselves in authority above God, we are entering into disobedience. And we're going to see that's exactly what happens in this beautiful garden on Mount Eden. So those are the parties. The covenant also includes promises, blessings, protection, perseverance. The king promises to protect the vassal state. He promises to, to keep foreign nations from invading. He promises to, to send whatever they might need. And then there's conditions. So long as the vassal state obeys, they will receive the blessing of the suzerain. There is obedience that is required on the subordinate's part. Otherwise, there is punishment. There is curse for disobedience. And these covenants, very often the fourth and final element, are signs. These are often repetitive seals of the promise. We'll touch on that when we get to Abraham, but uh, the uh, circumcision is a sign of the Abrahamic covenant. There are signs that are done repeatedly as seals of this covenant promise. And so we see this covenant structure, and what we have here is the covenant of works that God has established with Adam in the garden, a covenant. Adam, this is important because this is a good conversation about free will. In the garden, before the fall, Adam was made able to sin and able not to sin. Another way of saying that is Adam was the only human being on this earth to have a free will. And that was before the fall. <clears throat> Meaning Adam could follow, could obey, or he could disobey. He was created with that ability to obey, to disobey, to sin or not to sin. Spoiler alert, he'd made the wrong decision. But we'll get to that chapter 3. The promised blessing that God has with this covenant is communion and eternal life so long as he obeys. So if you imagine one way of, of understanding what's going on here is Adam in this covenant is put in a, in a probationary period. You, know, you hire a new uh, employee. You, you probably you are going to watch them for the first couple months, right? You want to make sure they're not, you know, they're doing their job. They're not going to steal. They're going to make sure you, you, they're going to have a probationary period. And after that time, maybe you'll up their pay or do whatever. I don't know. He's in a probationary period. He can sin or he can not sin. He can obey or he can disobey. If he obeys, he will elevate mankind into a, a, an area of blessedness, into a blessed communion and eternal life with God. If he disobeys, well, God threatens death and separation. So Adam can sin, or he's able to sin, and he's able not to sin. And these are the conditions, verse 17. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you shall surely die. So remember, there's two trees in the center of this garden on Mount Eden. Two very special trees. Now notice, let me jump back to verse 9. And out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. Semicolon in my Bible. So there's the trees that are good for eating. And then the tree of life in the midst and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then there are two other trees. The grammar here suggests that both of these trees were off limits to Adam. One is made explicitly, as we see here in verse 17, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. And the other tree 
he doesn't touch. So the conditions are, Adam can have any tree that he can cultivate. He can have from any bush, any fruit, any flower. He can have whatever he wants from those. But of the two in the center, and in particular one, is forbidden. That's the covenant of works that God establishes with Adam in this garden. Notice also that Adam is established as the federal head of the covenant people. Notice the, what's going on here. Adam, in this order, he's alone. Eve doesn't exist yet. She hasn't been made yet. His children haven't been born yet. You and I haven't appeared in anyone's eye. And yet we recognize that this covenant is made with a people, with a group. It's not just Adam. If Adam obeyed this command, he, he, eternal blessed rest would be for all people. All of mankind would be able to enjoy that. If he disobeyed, death fell upon each and every human being. Why? Because Adam is the federal head of the human race. We'll unpack that a little bit more in chapter 3. But for instance, an example, again, Bible study folks, you all heard this before. A federal head is someone who represents a group of people. Our federal head on the international stage is our, our president. Our federal head within our, our uh, form of government might be our congressional leaders. They represent you and me, wherever they are doing their business, they represent us as our federal head. Adam represents all of humanity as the federal head of the human race. If he obeys, fantastic. If he disobeys, something terrible happens. Verse 18 through 20. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird and of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. And the man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. Let me just gloss over real quick verse 19. I still see there's no contradiction between what is said here and what was said on the third day. The creatures were still created out of the earth, out of this createdness, and God brings them forth before Adam. But notice of what's most important in verse 18, we see the first thing that is not good in this good creation. So up until this point, everything's been good and dandy. It's paradise and the first not good is this that Adam is alone Adam as the federal head of this covenant that God just established well he needed a helpmate to complement his work and to complete his person on earth now when I say he's a, a, a compliment I'm not saying someone to praise him like, you know, oh, that's a nice compliment. Thank you. Oh, I'm glad you said some nice things about me. That's not the compliment that God creates for Adam. No, this is, this is someone who is a suitable helper, who can help him in this covenant of works, who can help him manage this dominion. The animals came before him, but they didn't fit this need. Animals can be man's best friend. Just ask any dog owner or any cat owner. You can, these are some of your best friends. We mourn the loss of our pets. We can have intimate bonds of friendship and love with animals. But animal kind cannot fill the complementary role that we need. Which is why... We don't go and marry our pets when it's creepy and two, it doesn't work. <laughs> Adam is put in charge 
over the animals. Notice there's a difference there. In verse 19, we see that out of the ground, God calls all them. He brings them to the man to see what he would call them. Adam is given authority over these animals to name them, to give them their names, to call them what he will. He is given authority over them. This is not so with his suitable helper, his helpmate. He needs a complement, not a subordinate. And this, of course, is the biblical model for marriage. Paul will appeal to this very passage when unpacking what marriage is. Don't have time to go into all of it, but let me just give you three brief points. Adam's help here is not a slave. The suitable helper here is not a servant, a subservient being. In fact, this word help in the Hebrew, sir is used of God. So that same word, helper, God uses, well, David uses of God in Psalm 33, where David says, the Lord is our help. Does that mean the Lord is our slave? The Lord is our servant? Absolutely not. The same is true of the spouse that God gives to Adam. She is not his slave, his servant, but his help. How does God help us? Well, we'll unpack that when we get to marriage another time. I want to move quickly. Third, second point. She is his complement. If he is the priest king of the garden, if he is given this, this priestly kingly role over the garden to cultivate and to keep, as we saw in the previous verses, then she is the life giver. She is the one who will help be fruitful and multiply. She is the one who will help him live and cultivate and dominate this created order. His rule, third point, is not authoritarian, but out of love. And her submission isn't servitude, but love. We get that from Ephesians chapter 5. Let me close with this final long point. Let me read verses 20 to 25 and we'll wrap up. The man gave names to all the cattle. Oh, we already read that, excuse me. So the Lord God, 21, caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Obviously, we don't live in paradise. And so the question then is, how do we talk about this wedding still? How is it fit for us today? Well, first of all, marriage is a partnership. We see that in verse 23. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Marriage is, a, is for partnership. Adam is made in God's image, which means man's loneliness contradicts God's blessed communion as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Did you hear that? We see the, tri, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who live eternally in relationship with one another. And as man is in this image of this God, his aloneness contradicts that very blessed communion that the three persons share. If God is in relationship in triunity, then you better believe that man created in his image cannot be alone. We are relational beings. 
if there's anything we've learned over the past 22 months, it's that we don't like isolation. We don't like being alone. We are relational beings. And so marriage is for covenant companionship in which both husband and wife reflect each other's strengths where they redouble each other's efforts and they reduce each other's weaknesses. Second point, marriage is for protection. Read here verse 24. For this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. This notion of union between husband and wife. We see that in the New Testament, Paul sees this as a very important aspect of fleeing from sexual immorality. We'll see this when we get to our series on 1 Corinthians this summer. But for now, I'll briefly just say in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul sees that sexual immorality is a huge temptation. And Paul recommends marriage as a way to uh, counteract that sexual morality. We'll unpack that this summer. Again, we're trying to do briefly. Paul also tells, says to flee temptation. That's 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. He says to flee temptation with godly discipline. That's in Titus 2.12. And we must be fleeing temptation by having accountable relationships. James tells us that in 5.16. This is how marriage acts in this way. Marriage is one of many accountable relationships and godly disciplines. It is for the protection of our hearts that we get married. Third point, marriage is for pleasure. Verse 25, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. There is a deep emotional and physical intimacy that a husband and wife share. That two people share when they have sex. I know we don't like to talk about that in church, but God talks about it a lot. We need to talk about it too. That sexual intimacy to know someone, we see that in chapter 3, which we'll touch on a little bit. This is an intimate knowledge <coughs> A type of relationship that only the husband and wife can know. A deep emotional and physical intimacy. They were not ashamed to share in that intimacy. They shared in their struggles and their dreams without rebuff or shame. That's how our marriage relationships are supposed to be. That we can be open with our spouse that we can share with them our dreams and our concerns. Indeed, for married Christians, we have a beautiful picture. We have a beautiful picture of two people with one hope and one desire. And that one hope and one desire is Christ. That's why Paul will say it's best to not be unequally yoked. Again, we'll touch on that this summer. Moreover, husband and wife are brothers and sisters in Christ. They are standing together before Christ. This is what it means to be a, a helpmeet, a suitable partner, a suitable helper. That we can stand before God, husband and wife, brother and sister in Christ. This, of course, is the picture of the church. We have a picture of a bride, us, and her husband. Christ. All of this was established and designed in Eden. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, first of all, I do want to thank you so much for establishing for us this covenant of marriage. As we see and as we will see that this fallen world has been corrupted and even our own marriages have fallen into sin. Lord, I pray that we can recognize the truth of the foundation of this intimate relationship. Lord, I, I pray that you forgive us, us as a people, 
us as individuals when we have disobeyed and dishonored this holy matrimony. Lord, I know that you are quick to forgive when there is repentance. And Lord, I know that when we repent and are forgiven, we turn and we cease following down those sinful paths. Lord, I pray that you help us to honor your design of marriage. And Lord, I pray that we can submit fully to your word, your teaching, your truth. Because you are our suzerain, our king. We are the vassal, lowly dust in which you've breathed life. Lord, we pray all this through the name of Christ, our mediator, our redeemer, our savior. Amen and amen. Friends, our final hymn is in Presbyterian hymnal number 539, Savior again to thy dear name we raise. I invite you to stand and join with me. Children of the living God, receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and bring you peace. And now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go out into this world. And remember, honor the Sabbath, trust in God, and love your Creator. Amen. Amen.